Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna. We're fortunate to be joined on the show today with Robert Cody. If you're not familiar with who Robert is, allow me to give you a quick background as our conversation could not be more timely. Robert Cody is the founder and CEO of Cody Capital, which is one of the world's leading intellectual property lawyers and investors. He has over 25 years of experience in identifying, valuing, and investing in breakthrough IP of technology companies that built new industries throughout the U.S. His experience firsthand challenges tech companies, uh, brings into focus the challenges tech companies face in the funding models that their business enters in the commercial markets. He developed the IP capital model as a better way of investing and scaling a new generation of these companies. Robert established and built the New York office of McCool Smith, which is one of the country's most successful IP law firms. He joined the firm in the midst of the global financial crisis. He's nationally recognized IP lawyer and was ranked number two among the top 50 best performing attorneys representing patent owners. He actually began his career as an electrical engineer, but now is known nationwide as a top attorney. Without further ado, here's Robert Cody. Robert, welcome to the show. Welcome. Nice to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you on board because it's, I mean, what when I say it's a timely topic, I know we just had uh, China floating spy balloons over the U.S. Right. And, right. You know, it brings front and center, like, you know, how close are we possibly to, to conflict with China or is this just kind of more of the same? I think it's more of the same. I like to have people step back and try to take the politics out of of, of it all. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, of that going on. Um, everybody needs to villain when they're in power because it keeps them in power. It's something to fight against. So we have to really be sober about what we read in the press. Uh, I've been to China many times and across China, and I can tell you that um, good people, they want to build a, a, a thriving economy for themselves. And we, of course, use the low-cost labor that was there for 25 years to essentially move our manufacturing offshore, and we benefited as a country. But we have to recognize that benefit came with a cost, which is we enabled an A-team in China, and that A-team is going to compete just like uh, any basketball team or baseball team or football team. And so we have to recognize uh, that uh, intellectual property has to be protected, but it doesn't mean we stay home. We'd be foolish to stay home. You need to know how to protect what you have when you scale around the world because there are 8 billion people in the world who can buy what you can deliver if it has value. And there's only 300 million in this country. The empire, I like to call it, the American empire was built uh, on a premise inconsistent or different than every other empire before. All empires before us were built on the notion of taking land and resources from others. The American empire is from sharing innovation around the world. And so while we brought value to the world and built eight teams around the world, we now have to recognize it's time to bring manufacturing home. It's time to reinvest in breakthrough innovation. And I've created a model that basically I've been perfecting over 20 years because I'm not just a lawyer. I'm one of the leading IP investors in the world focused on investing in that very thing. And so I've offered up a solution and a mission for the country as if I were president to drive us forward, recognizing that there isn't a villain on the other side of the pond. There's an A-team and we need to compete. And it's up to us to pick ourselves up and start to fight on the merits again. And that means investing not just in software, which is where venture capital plays today, but in hardware and breakthrough innovation based on deep science and engineering, because that's where the game changing uh, industries came from that built uh, this country and built the empire. And when you say a team, like that, we essentially said, okay, with the rise of globalization, you know, going back decades now, you know, we're going to essentially move this labor to cheaper places so that we could maybe get higher quality goods at a lower price. And it's a win-win for everybody. And that was the whole idea. When you say that that essentially created an a team over in China, which is now this manufacturing hub that we've all enjoyed up until now, what exactly do you mean by that, that a team? So it's natural when you ship your manufacturing offshore that you're shipping your IP. And when I say IP for the audience, we're not talking about patents and we're talking about the actual designs on how to make something, the know-how on how to make something. So it's uh, putting you in business. And so it's accelerating your learning curve. 
uh, so that you can now innovate and become an A-team player. Basically, you're no longer dependent on American innovation to take the world forward or take your country forward. You now have enough knowledge base to be able to compete, right? Just like an athlete, right? Um, once that team is there, they're going to um, do what they can to continue to be at the cutting edge. And that's what you're seeing in China. And mm -hmm. yes, they may be peeking under the hood, uh, but uh, we need to recognize that's going to happen, but that shouldn't scare us away from doing what we need to do today, which is what we haven't been doing for the past 20, 25 years, which is move back to hardware and fundamental fu uh, financing breakthrough innovation in this country, the next growth, the next industries. Uh, we stepped away from that. I think people don't realize that after the dot-com boom, software became king in this country. And we thought, well, we're going to innovate in software. We're no longer going to innovate or focus on it at the big company level. And so we're going to move our, uh, we're going to move our manufacturing offshore because if I'm not innovating to grow my market share and profits, I need to use lower cost labor to do it. And that's basically what happened. And uh, the country and venture capital moved over to software companies. And while it was a great ride, uh, you cannot build an economy without a manufacturing base. You cannot build an economy and keep it competitive without staying cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And we have many, many young companies that can take this country forward in the hardware space, rebuild our industrial base all around. How do I do things in a sustainable and renewable way? That's where the demand is in the world. It's yeah. all there. But we're watching the eight teams overseas pull our talent overseas because they're willing to pay for that talent to further strengthen their team, right? It's like mm -hmm. a base basketball team, a baseball team. I'm going to pay more than the next team to bring in the star, right? So we have to worry about that. And so is that, that is um, essentially could, uh, what's going on. Yeah. And if I could jump in on that point, I mean, is that actually happening that you're seeing executives or, or software engineers or top level talent here in America actually going to China and being employed by the Chinese? Yes, uh, China and other 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 Asian economies, right, that are looking to pick themselves up and grow their economy, economy and be become more abundant. So if hmm. you need to compete, you're going to try to hire the best talent. And so when venture capital is only funding software today, which is really, and we can talk about why that is and the problems with that and, and how it's um, revealed to us, Silicon Valley Bank is just one indicator of the venture capital model being broken, both in the way it works and in its focus on software, we see that um, because we're not funding, we're only funding software companies on mass in venture capital and not hardware companies. What are you going to do if you've got a great innovation and you can't get the capital? You want to build that dream. You want to see that dream realize. Well, you need a partner to make it. Most of the manufacturing is over, overseas, so they start overseas with an advantage right there. And if they're willing to pay you more and actually invest in your business, are you going to stay here and die or are you going to move overseas? And yes, that is happening. Absolutely. Wow. And so what, I mean, what areas, it sounds like you're, you're a fan of globalization that we should be, you know, looking, you know, as opposed to like a villain, like you said, look at them as a friend that we can, you know, all the ships can rise together. Are there right. certain sectors that you think we need to be manufacturing domestically and others that we should take advantage of, of Asian economies or elsewhere where we, we can get a, a cheaper benefit? So I think, uh, the answer is that we should be investing in all industries, in companies that are through technology, through IP, transforming how products are made in those industries, how hardware is made, physical products. And we should mm -hmm. uh, do that across all industries to retool our base here in America. And we should avoid investing in and manufacturing products that no longer have an innovation advantage, meaning too many people around the world can do it. So I okay. like to say the old stuff is not coming back, but the new stuff is gonna find its way overseas if we don't pay attention and shift from a venture capital model to an IP capital model, which is what I do and have perfected over 20 years to great success because uh, if we don't move and I'm not, uh, if we don't move, we're gonna watch uh, not only are manufacturing, the old manufacturing, which is already overseas, disappear. 
we should stay overseas to answer your question. Not enough margin and not enough growth to support labor costs in the US. But if we don't focus on the next generation of those hardware companies with breakthrough innovations, mm -hmm. again, transforming how we make products more sustainable, uh, more renewable, more environmentally friendly, that's where the demand is, we're going to lose what essentially is going to propel any economy in the future and we'll be left behind and that would not be a good thing. Okay, so it sounds like kind of the smart stuff, the new stuff needs to happen here, for sure. Right. And then it, the older things that everybody can have access to that uh, don't require such a high level of talent or intelligence that we can keep abroad. Exactly. And, I, and I'll add to it just so people kind of get the sense. Why do, why do we think manufacturing went overseas? Well, when the economy moves to software and away from hardware, they're moving away from the manufacturing, in effect, right? Physical products need to be manufactured. Digital products, software... I copy, I hit a button, copy, and the and the download comes, right? Like, I don't have equipment and an industrial base that's capital intensive to build out. So when manufacturing moves offshore, it's because we stopped innovating uh, at the big company level, right? The mature mm -hmm. company. We continue to innovate at the young company, the new seedlings. And that's what we want to make sure stays here. So the new stuff stays here. So we stay competitive, but the old stuff went overseas because we stopped innovating. When you innovate and you create more value for somebody and it's substantially more value than they can get from a competitive product, customers are going to buy your product. You're going to grow and you're going to be able to get a premium. So we're able to grow our profits and our market share if we're innovating. That's point number one. When we stop innovating, and many, many people can do what we do here in the United States. It becomes a race where everybody offers that same value and everybody is undercutting them on price. So profits drop because price drops. And now I have to figure out if I'm not going to invest in the next generation as a big company, which is what's happened over the past 20 years. I got to move overseas where I can take advantage of low cost labor because now my labor cost goes down and my profits go up, even though I'm not organically doing it to actually continuing to innovate. So I'm always giving somebody more value in everything I sell in the future. And so that's what caused manufacturing to move offshore. And to your point, the new seedlings are here that are transforming how we make manufacturing, or how we do manufacturing across all our industries. They're not getting the capital support they need that's why I created Cody Capital. That's why I left my profession as a lawyer and IP investor. And we can talk about some of the experience there that will yeah. drive home what I'm doing. But that's why I left because I realized that when you are focused on something and you do it long enough, like venture capital, you, you wind up sitting in a box and it's hard to break free the chains that hold you in the box. So even though they may know the model is broken and even they, they, they may know their software focus is the wrong focus today and they need to move over to hardware, their funds are 10 years long, they're based on uh, uh, venture capital equity style, they're based on software. So it's very hard to move them over. I created yeah. Cody Capital as really a mission, a movement to bring awareness to the public of what's going on because if we don't keep our young growth on yes. the hardware side here, we're going to lose the next generation of economic value and we're going to feel it. We're yeah. totally going to feel it. And, and I want to come back to that, the the funding and kind of where your company comes into play in a minute. But maybe just to kind of lay out the landscape a little better for, for our viewers and our listeners. Sure. What would you say are, are the areas where we really need to bring things back ashore? Is it pharmaceuticals? Is it, uh, you know, a high tech weaponry? Is it, uh, you know, is it is it the microchips that that are all we're just all competing over in Taiwan? And then the last thing, too, is you mentioned the seedlings. And I think what gives people a lot of promise and a lot of hope is if you look at some of the biggest companies in the world and we talk about, you know, Facebook or Meta, mm -hmm. you talk about Google, uh, Apple, Amazon, you know, American companies. Is it now is TikTok a threat or, you know, what are the threats, I guess, like what sectors are we possibly losing at? So we're, we're focused today at, at the government level in regulating 
how companies manufacture. So I would say it's manufacturing industries across the board, semiconductor, uh, computer, uh, uh, solar energy. Solar is a big one. And anything that um, is manufactured today is in need of kind of a retooling so that it is sustainable, which is it uses less resources, natural. It reuses its waste, so it's circular. And it pollutes the environment less. And that may seem simple, but the reality is, is uh, that's where the demand is. So all big companies in the world are under pressure from the public and governments to transform how they make products. So all the young technology companies are figuring out how to make what a, an existing industry does more sustainable for the environment. But people are willing to pay a premium for it. That means I now can sell that the, the products I've been selling, I can sell at a higher price. Or I can sell a whole new type of product. An example would be, and I'm not sure the audience is aware of this, but there are companies now, one of which I'm involved with, uh, that are coating windows and walls of buildings with a transparent coating that you can't see that turns the whole building into a solar panel that instead of sitting on the roof and looking aesthetically not pleasing is invisible to the eye yet it will supplement right now 25% growing to 50 and over the next decade 100% of the power in the building or the home. That's a revolution. So anything that's making our world sustainable, transforming a manufacturing base in an industry so it's more sustainable, right? Less polluting, less use of natural resources, is really an efficiency play. So I'm going to make things more efficient, grow profitability. People are willing to pay for a premium. So I want to focus on any technology company that's driving this, meeting the sustainability or sustainable development goals that big companies are tasked with today. Any big company today has got a sustainable initiative, yeah. every one of them. Uh, and then um, I also want to be focused in renewable energies uh, what are the different ways that I can power uh, my devices from my car to my home? And there are a variety of different technologies, but the coolest one in my mind is the one that coats a building and turns it into a solar that panel crazy. you can't see with your eyes. That is insane. And along those lines, because I mean, like going green is, is certainly a buzzword right now. How real is that per perhaps? Because, you know, lots of times you see that they have these summits and it's kind of one of those like ultimate feel good, do nothing moments where we say we're going to reach all these, you know, lofty goals 20, 30, 40, 50 years from today, um, right. you know, where these politicians all be long gone by the time they ever get to that, that horizon. So like when we're competing on an international stage and, and this is, I think this is what a lot of people just think when they, they just, it just comes to mind that, you know, well, we compete against China they could care less. We compete against Mexico. They could care less if they're blowing right. fumes into the air and toxic waste in their streets. And so naturally they can produce things at a much, much cheaper rate than right. we can. If we have companies that are saying, okay, one, I've got to go through all this, you know, red tape to, to kind of get mm -hmm. to where we need to be. And two, I've got to invest in these new technologies to be clean, um, where our competitors maybe don't have to do that. Well, it goes back to what does the government and the public, the governments around the world and the public want. So when the public and the governments are demanding it through existing and coming regulations, you have no choice. So I would say there's no choice. So we okay. start there. So it's not a question of in China, they're not going to do it. And we are every company in the world, Chinese and non-Chinese wants sustainable has sustainable development goals and renewable energy goals and decarbonization goals that aren't fake aren't made up they're real and they're driven either by existing regulations or coming regulations and i'll give you a really good example that i think will drive home the point and and probably a lot of what we've talked about already so i have a company that is in the textile industry and mm -hmm. textiles have moved offshore uh long ago 25 years ago, 
because cheap labor or low-cost labor was available overseas, they weren't innovating. And so manufacturing moved overseas to cut and sew the garments. And so we now have a company uh, that I'm involved with that can take the textile waste off the factory floor or out of the recycling bin or pre-consumer waste where the H&M, the fast fashion industry, every month is turning over the next design and they got a lot that doesn't sell, it sits in warehouses. We can take all that and rejuvenate it, not recycle it, but rejuvenate it, which is the ultimate form of recycling. Recycling typically downgrades existing yeah. technologies. You, you don't really have something you can make the same garment with. But imagine a rejuvenation form of recycling, and this is a 150 meter long, long line that can take the waste off the factory floor and turn it into virgin quality fiber that can now make the same garment turned into fiber into yarns then into fabric to make the same high quality garment now imagine i can buy that waste for pennies on the dollar and sell it at the same price as virgin quality think of the margins there giant margins so now you see that by being smart and sustainable in how i make a product and beginning to use my waste to bring down the cost of my inputs instead of petroleum produced fibers, I reuse my waste. I can make a more profitable business for myself. Wonderful, yeah. right? Now you see how profits emerge. That's point number one. Point number two is imagine if a company, and you can go look this up, we'll use H&M as an example, has goals that drive the need for that technology. So H&M has a goal by 2025, that 30% of the 3 billion garments they sell annually, 3 billion around the world, will have 30% uh, of the fiber used in those garments will be recycled. That's one of my companies. And by 2030, 100%. So who doesn't want to get in the game of investing in technology companies? And there's a whole bunch of them yeah. coming up with different recycling technologies just in textile. And this is happening in every industry where we can sure. get inputs on penny for pennies on the dollar instead of spending the big bucks for petroleum produced products. And now I can grow my business. And the reason I can grow it is somebody like H&M has a goal and they need to meet it. Yeah. It, no, and I, I love to hear that because I'm as, as green as green gets where I think that not only is it the future, I think it needs to be the future if we want to kind of keep the planet that we've enjoyed for, you know, the past 2000 years, the way that we, uh, the way that we want it. Uh, but, and I'll, I'll add a point. I like to give a buzzword. If you go to my website at CodyCapital.com, yeah. what you'll see is I've got on my about page a little tagline, and it's cute, but it's true. Green is the new gold. Yeah, if I'm that, paying I for gold, it. I'm looking for green. And if I'm not looking for green, then I'm not looking in the right place. That's the <laughs> bottom line. How long do you think a, a company ha or even a sector has to sustain a loss before they have that breakthrough? And I ask that because if you look at like, you know, electric vehicles, for instance, that's the pushback I always get when I bring it up. I have uh, the Kia EV6, which I love, and it's my first time actually going electric. But when you talk with a lot of people, they say, well, it's just too expensive. And, and that's why the past, you know, 15 years, maybe I couldn't afford a Tesla. So just because I have to make economic decisions, I'm out here driving, you know, an older, you know, used car that's guzzling gas and polluting the air, um, not because I want to, but it's because it's what my household can afford. And so there's always, it seems like this curve where, you know, it things become too expensive or, or unaffordable before they become mainstream. Um, is that is that just a natural thing that a company has to say, you know, we might bite the bullet for a period of time before we cross that threshold? So I, I think it depends on the company. Um, but what I invest in is companies that aren't depending on those subsidies from the government in order to grow that business that is transforming an industry green. It's a no brainer, obviously, to invest in something where you're not dependent on somebody else's subsidy to grow that business, where yeah. your ability to drive down the cost of manufacturing through technology that uses fewer natural resources and makes that cost a good soul to make that widget, that product much, much lower. I'm focused on that company where they can sell that product with the higher performance, the green, mm -hmm. uh, at a price point that's the same or equivalent 
uh, to what exists in the market today so that we make it a no brainer for people to switch. Yeah. You have two problems. One is you want to make it affordable. The second is you want to make the value prop for you, not only affordable, but you want to make it a, so compelling in what it will deliver to you in value beyond what you have today, as you're willing to step out of your comfort zone, pay attention and put the energy into adopting it. And there is a lot of resistance that people have to anything new. And mm -hmm. so it's, you try to make sure it's the same price and doesn't depend on subsidies like Elon Musk's business at Tesla. And yeah. you try to make sure that you offer a value proposition that's a step function beyond what they can get today. So it's compelling for them. It doesn't cost more and it gives them so much more value that they will put the time and energy into figuring out that they want to buy. And that's how you want, that's how you invest in a company that's transforming an industry green. Now, with that said, yeah. Governments can be very helpful in areas like electric vehicles, where there's a, a need for lots of reasons to cause a transition. And in some cases, we have to bite the bullet and accept the fact that we're dependent on subsidies from the government because the capital requirement and the infrastructure bill that required is so enormous that private capital may not be able to take that bill on, right? That cost. Mm -hmm. And yes, you may, be, may experience something less affordable early on, and that's the trade-off. I try to focus where I'm not dependent on that. And there are many, many companies in the green space, green is the new gold, as I like yeah. to say, that um, don't depend on those subsidies to grow that business. They can offer you the same product with more value at the same price to make it compelling for you and to allow broad or widespread adoption because the only real value in anything green uh, which um, when I say that, I, I don't talk just about the environment. I look at transition to green as the way we grow our economy and keep our people you know, fed and, and, and making a good living, et cetera. So you really want to focus on that kind of uh, green company. Uh, and that's what I focus on. Okay, understood. And then question around those companies. So it's, we've kind of touched on two threats that such a company could face or hurdles, maybe is a better word. Um, one would be finding capital, okay? And, and I want to ask you kind of why you say the venture capital model is dead or, or not performing the way that maybe an optimal model would. Uh, and then on the other side, and maybe this is a little bit later on when that company does say, all right, we're finally hitting the ground running, is right. the the IP issues, um, which like we said, and, and I'd like to go back to that with, with China because- that's nothing new. I mean, it's they've been notorious for creating literally identical Apple stores in China that have no affiliation whatsoever with Apple. Right. So is that a problem to worry about down the road where a company getting started is maybe more just concerned about funding and then they come back to, well, how do we protect it now that we finally built it? So that's a big question. And I have a good answer, <laughs> it is. a great answer that I think people will, um, there'll be a paradox in what I'm about to say. <laughs> that's um, inconsistent with what they read in the press, um, but it's the way to think about it. And it's mm -hmm. based on being on the front lines for 25 years. So maybe a third aspect we can get to is to give some examples of what I'm about to say from my own um, experience investing in fundamental innovation, fundamental IP, breakthrough IP, and that'll drive it home. But um, I think I heard two questions. One is why is the venture capital model broken? And yep. when do we think about protecting what we have while we're challenged with raising capital? I think those are the two that I get yeah. them wrong. Yeah, we can tackle one at a time, but I think eventually they kind of blend together. They do. And and I think let's start with venture capital and why the model is broken. Um, and it doesn't mean that venture capitalists are bad guys. They're not. They fulfill the need in this country. You look at venture capital and go back you know, uh, a century, you'll see the industry was actually not focused on software, but hardware. They were building the computer industry, the semiconductor industry, the textile, you name it, it was an industrial base that created the prosperity in this country that we've allowed us to escape overseas. And by the way, that's, again, not a bad thing. We want to benefit the world because there's more people to buy our goods. The more the world lifts up, all boats rise with a rising tide. So we got to start from an abundance perspective and not vilify. So I would say the same thing as with venture capital. Dot-com bus shows up, 
internet companies are selling with high multiples. They're going public at high valuations. We need to get in that game. We need to move away from hardware to the next cool thing. And that's where, where they spent the past 25 years mm -hmm. focused on software and an equity model that is like a lottery ticket. And so while that sounds cool and we hear about the Facebooks and the Twitters and the, you know, the social media companies uh, and the software apps that obviously have been valuable gaming apps, et cetera. We have to recognize something that the barriers to entry in software are very, very low because mm. it's pretty easy for somebody to copy that software and to build that store, a Starbucks or an Apple store copycat. So it's easy when the barriers are, to, are low for somebody to essentially copy what you're doing. And venture capital has suffered the consequences of that focus because most venture capital funds don't return their capital and the performance across the industry is well below what investors would like to see. And so it's become truly a lottery ticket that I buy hoping I'm gonna win, but we all know that usually when we look at the numbers on the screen, you know, we've zeroed out, right? So that's really what's happened. And they've had a, they've had a hard time liquidating their investments. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank shows that the next round's not happening and then the exits aren't happening. And for the model to work, you know, every five to 10 years of run with a company, I've got to get, I've got to have an exit, right? To get mm -hmm. returns that on paper I pumped up. So there's a lot of pump and dump going on where on paper, if everybody's, you know, uh, you know, valuing their companies to get another tur two turns, you know, doubling their money from round to round, everybody's in the game. And on paper, the, the venture capital returns grow. But when that fund looks to ex uh, exit or liquidate those investments to get cash from that paper, that's where it falls apart. And so it's become really a lottery ticket. And people are, are you know, uh, unhappy with that. And, and so that's why the model is broken. What I'm doing in moving you over to hardware and funding, you know, breakthrough innovation again is that's deep science and engineering. Mm -hmm. It takes five or 10 years for that company to get to market. But when they get to market, if they truly have something breakthrough, the value prop is enormously different than the next guy on the block. Yeah. And so their revenues will be durable. And the ability to copy them, challenging, usually for five years or more. So I'll get like a new drug that has a, a patent protection. You know, the way we do it in drugs is we give you a monopoly as a drug company for five years if you have a patent on the drug. Over in the tech company, you don't get that regulatory benefit, but you can get it de facto if it's a deep science and engineering company. So I'll look at that company. I'll look to see if they're truly different. I'll look to see if the contract base that they have early in their revenue life shows customers appreciate that difference in that value. And now I have a business I know has got longevity. We'll call it a moat around that business. Very, very yep. hard to copy it. And that's what you want to be investing in. And that's the failing of venture capital, the focus and the equity model. We want to move over to high barriers, durable revenues, and share in revenues where people are getting paid to wait instead of waiting for a pop 10 years down the road, like in venture capital, that more often than not does not happen. So, and I just want to make sure I'm following you correctly. So it sounds like venture capital in and of itself isn't broken, if you will. It's just that as of late, they've been putting their money into the wrong places. The last 25 years, because they built 10-year funds, what was hot 25, we'll call it 20, 25 years ago, was internet companies, software companies. So all the funds got built and they last for 10 years. And in the first five years of your first 10 years, on paper, you're showing great results, right? You haven't exited anything. You build your second fund. So you basically, whenever you have a transition to software or the next great thing, typically you're going to have 20, 25 years of life before venture can shift back. Mm -hmm. They're stuck with the funds that they built that have a mandate for software and an equity model. They can't just break free of, of those commitments and so that's why it's very, very hard to move back to hardware for them today. And the model doesn't really work for a hardware company for a lot of reasons. The equity model, you need a venture revenue sharing model. That's what IP capital is. Instead of equity, yeah. it's revenue sharing. Oh, so people okay. get so, paid cash flows to wait, cash flows. Got, so traditional venture capital, that's you know where they're, they're putting up a large sum of money to buy equity in that company. 
but then it's just sit around and wait until maybe they go public or the, the company gets bought out or, or something like that, where they get their big payday way down the road. And what happened with Silicon Valley Bank says that's not working. When Silicon Valley, the way Silicon Valley Bank works is they're actually coming in in a down economy and they're helping with debt, bridge loans, the venture capitalists extend the runway of the company until the economy turns around and they can get that lift in the valuation on paper. Mm -hmm. And number one, and they're also bridging the company to the exit when they can get a higher valuation to exit. Because remember, they got to get a certain return and doing the round in the down economy or doing the exit in the down economy means the values are down. They're not going to get the return they need to go to get the next round. It will be on paper and in an exit, it'll be in cash, right? For the yep. fund. And so when Silicon Valley Bank is failing, it means that the model is revealing the model is, is broken. The ability to get to the next round is challenged with the appropriate valuation, which means that that company that lives round around can't pay the bills, can't pay the bank, it's interest payment. Yeah. And usually the way these loans work is they're mm -hmm. balloon payments at the exit. And if the exit is delayed, right? And you cannot exit your company, you can't pay the balloon payment. And so now all of a sudden the bank that in a, in a good economy and with the right focus, right? Not software. So software has revealed in a down economy that it's, I, I should say the down economy has revealed that software focus has been really challenging. They're not able to get to the next round at the right value. They're not able to get to the next exit at the right value. And that means the bank can't get paid its interest payment, can't, get its money back, that balloon payment at the end of the term of the loan. <clears throat> and what Silicon Valley Bank shows you is the venture capital model isn't doing what it is supposed to do, what it was built upon. It shows you the model is broken. Yeah. And and I don't think it helped that, uh, you know, SVB was just so heavily concentrated in you know, one, one pot of deposits of venture yeah. capitalists. Where, right. you know, it was just kind of like a, a flip of a switch. They could send out an email saying, hey, they're they're raising $2 billion to shore up their books. You know, pull your deposits now. And then, boom, it's like this whole little niche industry that was there was able to essentially create a almost a run right on the bank. Well, exactly. And so the way that the Silicon Valley Bank and other banks grew up was, was venture debt was created to bridge, like I said, the next round or the, the exit. The down economy isn't the source, the sole source of the problem. It's the focus on software companies. So if you talk to a lot of venture capital firms, you'll find that because software has such low barriers to entry, I could pick the best software company that's new in the market. It looks game changing, but because too many competitors can get in the game too quickly, the barriers are low to, to developing something comparable. You wind up when it comes time five or 10 years out on that investment and you have to liquidate it, you can't liquidate it. Uh, there are too many choices for buyers. You can't get the value anymore because there are too many copycats or alternatives out there. So you can't go public. They can't liquidate these investments. So if you have the wrong focus and you're struggling to get valuations for your software company because of this low barrier to entry and the competition that emerges after your investment, and you can't exit your companies for all the reasons I just mentioned. And then you double down, I call it a double whammy with a prolonged downturn driven by the pandemic. All of a sudden, the, 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 the woes of the venture capital model show itself. Yeah. And the heavy weighting that you talk about of being too concentrated in venture capital, which looks great in the in the in the storied years but looks terrible once you start to shift your focus from hardware over to software and it works for a while too many venture capitalists chasing too many deals in an industry software where too many copycats can emerge challenging the next round financing challenging the exit double whammy it with a with a prolonged downturn and now you see venture capital's model really isn't working where they're focused and the lottery ticket isn't what people want. We really yeah. should be sharing in revenues and the economics because the revenues are a true test of whether that company is doing well and is creating value. I should share in that. 
Gotcha. And I should help the next generation of hardware companies grow. So that's kind of my maybe, you know, longer winded explanation yeah. for what's going on. And, and that's what I wanted to kind of get was like almost the, the layman's terms of your model, it, it kind of this, this, in a, this next iteration almost of venture capital where venture, again, like we said, you, you put up a huge sum of money, you get equity in the company and you cross your fingers that it, it turns into Facebook. Right. You're, you're saying that along the way, rather than having that big weight and, you know, run into these massive liquidity issues that instead of equity, you're now getting a revenue sharing for a period of time. And then the company gets to keep the shares of the company, essentially. They get to keep uh, their equity uh, and we receive uh, a buyout of that royalty stream in the exit. We can hold that as a contractual percentage of the exit to buy out our revenue stream, or we can hold it in equity. No matter how you cut it, we're either not playing in the equity stack, our equity is much more limited than a venture capital. But the point is, I'm still leaving the investor with um, a taste of substantial upside in the outcome, but he's not wedded to when that happens. Yeah, uh, He knows that he's going to get his uh, share of revenue to pay him back over five years. The company exits the way we model it. We're getting a one X off the top. So I'm guarant not guaranteeing, but I'm modeling a, a ground game instead of a, a hit, a swing for the fences for the grand slam. When I step mm -hmm. up at the plate, a ground game a says I get it. my money back over five years through a share of revenue. Uh, I get a one X to make sure in the exit, I get a double before anybody participates the equity. And then I participate in the exit to buy out, um, my revenue share, and I'm looking to at least get another turn. So when I model investment, I look at a five-year run, breakthrough companies need a good five years to really show that promise. Mm -hmm. I'm making sure I'm getting a, 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 a single along the way, a double off the top in the exit, and a triple from the remaining values. So when you invest with me, we're shooting for doubles and triples, right? Uh, we're insuring a single, we're going for doubles and triples, much better place to play than trying to step up at the plate, holding extremely onerous equity positions in companies that in the software realm usually don't play out and it becomes a lottery ticket and you're not happy at the end because what looked promising turns out to zero out and I'm yeah. changing the game. No longer do we swing for the fences when we step up at the plate and wait years for a strikeout, which is normally what happens. We go for doubles and triples and we play a ground game instead of a Hail Mary game. But isn't that, wouldn't that be difficult as like the seedling company that's saying, hey, we're just getting started. We're in desperate need of funding so that we can invest in our company and grow so that we can get to the promised land. And then along that time, you know, you're you're essentially taking revenues that, that might not even really be existent yet. So we don't focus pre-revenue. Because to your point, you're correct, right? You yeah. wouldn't want to focus. My model wouldn't be workable pre-revenue. It's only workable post-revenue or uh, near revenue when you know the revenue will be there and be durable. Okay, so it's not so such seedling companies. So venture capital model, the equity model still holds to get companies to a point when they get when they're near market. And by the way, on the hardware side of the house, companies are still being grown through equity. When they get to uh, a market and they've got these customers out there, customers won't buy because they can't get enough capital to show they have the financial wherewithal. It's big capital to build out the manufacturing, to produce the product. And so the customer knows you're going to be able to deliver on your promise in that contract. Private equity wants them to be a few years out with a lot of, with history, right? All the execution wrong, uh, risk wrung out. And they want to, uh, uh, you know, put a lower cost of capital on it. So private equity is not there when these young hardware companies that I've been talking about are entering the market. Venture capitalists are not there either. They've shied away from hardware and moved to software. Mm -hmm. And so while equity models, which typically are strategics, angels, and more boutique venture capital firms, right, niche yeah, we'll get the company to market, but they don't have the larger capital requirement to scale them. There's a huge gap in capital available to these young hardware companies. So I'm coming in as they're entering markets and I'm looking and underwriting the contract base. Who's going to buy? How long term are they going to buy? And how durable are the revenues 
because the durability of the revenues matter. And I'm looking at how high are the barriers because I can see a contract base and it all looks great, right? I want to make sure that replicating what you do isn't like what's happening in software where the barriers are low and I'll have a McDonald's and a Burger King and a Hardee's in no yeah. time once I start to show the world the value of my software. In my hardware model, it's more like a drug investment. When you have a breakthrough drug, it's very, very hard to catch up with that. A lot of science and engineering. And yeah. so to answer your question, we don't just invest pre-revenue. We're at revenue. We don't just invest simply because they have revenue. We look at the contract base and we want to make sure this company is really going to go the distance with durable revenue and based on contract base. And we want to make sure they have high barriers to entry. And that means it's very long development timelines for anybody to catch up and lots of money to replicate that deep science and engineering investment. Yep. And also for the high barrier, which may be a real inroad to the question of how do you protect it? Do they have a strategy to protect and how are they thinking about protecting what they have as they venture yep. into the world? Because uh, the world is not like the field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Many of these hardware companies have seen the capital does not come and they struggle and they, uh, often give away more than they need to give away to the rest of the world. And big companies can run with a ball and they're left with nothing. Yeah. And it becomes a lawsuit if they're lucky. And based on my experience, more often than not, they haven't done their job to protect what they have. They thought and the world question, would be good to them. Robert, and they're which... left with zero. And I created what I am doing today, IP Capital and Cody Capital, yeah. to not cry over the companies that would come to me after it was too late, but to come in and help them grow and make sure they're doing the right things to protect what they have. And so that that's that was going to be my next question is, so we have the company, it's growing, you're investing it, and everything's going well. You mentioned that in, in our economy with a pharmaceutical, you des design a pharmaceutical, and then you essentially have a five-year monopoly before that patent expires, where you said that, you know, if you go back to the software, that's been the, the issue is that that doesn't really exist. There's a lot of exposure. So you mentioned... Oh, maybe 15 minutes ago that I think it was deep science or engineering has Correct. some extra protections to it. Is that from the government or is it just the way that it's just harder to get there to replicate? It's like, what, what so is that to, protection? To make it simple, it's harder to get there. So anything breakthrough that's taking um, a hardware business, a real product business, manufacturing real product in all industries, um, innovation to make it sustainable and how it uses resources, meaning more efficient and thus more profitable or renewable in the way it produces energy or decarbonizing an industry. All of that um, uh, is deep science and engineering that takes five or 10 years to discover. And then once you've discovered the break, you now need to implement it in the real world in a real product. And now you have to design proprietary equipment to make this new and different thing in a new and different way. And so that's, that's why you see these five or 10 years of development, basic yeah. research and then development to actually sell a commercial product over in the software realm. Once somebody has developed an Uber like app, the technology is not breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy for somebody to go create their own Uber like Lyft. But there's, and there's so, not like a, uh, you know, a certain law or patent law that, that you're able to rely on where, I mean, what if we call it this deep science and engineering by company A that's doing incredible work and they're they're doing this thing we never even thought of. But what if there's a company B across the country that's running on a parallel track? We don't know about it, but they're essentially trying to target the same thing and they're they're kind of neck and neck. It's just not public yet. So that is one of the risks you run, right? So yep. investing is not risk free, but you want to invest in a in a in a market with a large TAM, right? Total addressable market, meaning there's room for more than one. Number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you only want to invest in the company where as far as your research and investigation shows, is the only innovator with the breakthrough. And it took five or 10 years to get there. And you've underwritten that the barriers are high for somebody to catch up. There's no perfection that in that meaning there could be somebody in the skunk works that emerges. So yeah, that's where um, you want to make sure it's a growing market with a large TAM because there's always going to be room for more than one. Yeah. People want choice. 
And that's the way you hedge that risk, but you certainly don't walk into the market where you think and can see that risk is a serious risk, parallel track, and you're going to yeah. enter the market at the same time. Uh, that would be a change in um, whether you would invest in that or not. Does our patent law, is there anything else like there is for pharmaceuticals where, like you said, there's literally like a five-year monopoly where you hit the there, jackpot and you get to live off of it for five years? Like, does that exist in tech? It does not exist today. Um, the government could create that. They created it in the pharmaceutical industry because billions of dollars are spent trying to find the next breakthrough drug. Similar in the new realm of hardware, we're spending hundreds of millions. It may not be breakthroughs. I mean, billions for a breakthrough in the drug space, but we're spending a lot more money to find that breakthrough in the hardware realm than we are in the software. Again, much more incremental in the innovation. So you could create a regulatory body to give that hardware company protection. I don't have an answer to that. I can just yeah. tell you that the government created it in the pharmaceutical industry to really, through lobbying efforts in that industry, to recognize it takes billions to find the blockbuster. And if they're going to spend that heavy bet, they need enough of a monopoly for enough of a period of time to get a return on that investment. Sure. Otherwise, what happens? We go home and we say, too bad, so sad. If I can't get a return, I'm not going to spend the next billion. So that's what created that patent protection. So to answer your question, it's not as heavy a bet in the tech space, in the hardware breakthrough space. It's still a pretty heavy bet. That has not happened. Uh, I don't see that happening. So what I underwrite is the next best thing, de facto high barrier to entry, de facto monopoly, a motor around your business. And by the way, that's how Warren Buffett invests in his companies. He looks for de facto monopoly, a motor around the business, whether it's the process you use that's better, where I like to give the Coca-Cola example to the audience. When he invested in Coca-Cola, he said, well, if they can make a recipe that everybody wants to buy, and by the way, they buy more of it in downtimes, like alcohol, right? Yeah. Uh, people tend to buy the vices more in downtime. And so the opposite happens in those kinds of markets. He says, that's a game I want to play in, right? And then he said, well, if they can do it here in America, I'm going to bet on scaling them internationally. And we're going to tweak the recipe in all of these countries. And we're going to create a recipe that's adapted locally to the taste buds. And we're going to scale Coca-Cola internationally on the same premise that if I can get them hooked on Coca-Cola, not American Coca-Cola, but locally adapted Coca-Cola, I can replicate the good thing in America and I can do it in 189 countries. And that's how I'm going to scale Coca-Cola. That's called IP investing. And it may not be breakthrough technology, uh, but it is a breakthrough IP innovation. And we can get into how they've protected that and what, what's important in terms of protecting. But I invest in companies with breakthrough innovations, with high barriers to entry and a real smart, uh, strategy around how I'm going to take advantage of the world and not keep it close to the vest and not stay yeah. home, not stay in the closet. And that takes a strategy to protect, to have the courage to enter the global playing field and take on that risk of copying and theft that we read about in the papers all the time that, by the way, can totally be mitigated so that you reap the benefits of what you've created uh, around the world and uh, you don't limit yourself. Yep. Yeah. In to to that point, as we kind of wrap up here, I know we're we're covering a lot of different ground here, but it is the economy that that we live in right now. You were quoted recently. You said, and I quote: "China has been quietly stealing our intellectual property for years, hindering our economic growth and causing the U.S. to lose the innovation race." Along, and I think everybody would agree with you on that. Let's say you're sitting in the Oval Office right now. The president tapped you and said, "How do we fix this?" Right. What do you, what would you say? I would say to the president, we need to invest in bringing manufacturing home so that our young companies have a manufacturing base to partner with, to scale their new innovations. It's very capital intensive for them to grow. So we don't watch our new seedlings, our new growth move overseas where the manufacturing is and they can get the support they need. They need. So that would be point number one. Point number two is I would say to the president that we need to 
have a strategy that incentivizes sharing. This is the paradox, sharing our innovations around the world, the way we built the empire in the first place. But we need to get smart again uh, after bringing it home. We need to get smart when scaling it to reap the benefits instead of holding it in our pocket. We need to get smart about how uh, we share because sharing is where the value comes from for Americans. It's also where the value comes for, uh, from for the rest of the world. And we, we want the rest of the world to prosper too. But we know that our economy requires, just like in the drug industry, a certain level of return to make those investments worthwhile. So you really need, Mr. President, to strengthen our patent system, our IP protection system. And you need to encourage these companies to not look at what they're growing when they scale as the field of dreams, that if they build it, people will come. People need to have a new model and a new focus, which is where IP capital is, is, is rooted on not only investing in companies uh, to scale them globally, to take advantage, but to think about how do I protect it in the right way? So protection actually comes through sharing. And, and, and why is that? Well, if I don't share, the rest of the world's incentivized to come up with their own thing. But if I innovate here, I want to share to reap the benefits. But I'm actually sharing not only to reap the benefits, but to protect. And that seems odd, but it's a lot of money to develop this breakthrough. If you can offer it to people around the world and partner with them so they can get in the game. So instead of your team driving the new car with the new engine, you get other teams around the world through partnerships like franchising a business, building cars in their local markets with your engine. You're scaling your business. You're creating value for people around the world. You're deterring that copying. It's another way to protect. So that's the paradox. Uh, again, bring manufacturing home. Don't allow it to go overseas. Scale these businesses and have a smart way of protecting um, uh, that innovation as they scale, recognizing scaling is one of the pillars of, of protecting innovation. Those are the three yeah. things that I think about every day. Yeah. And it, it sounds like it, it, my takeaway from that was almost don't work against us, but work for us. And as you do so, it'll be really nice for you guys as well. And I, and I think that exactly all all boats rise with a rising tide. The public should appreciate that um, agendas are put forward in the news, often political agendas. The notion that sure. uh, China is stealing our IP, well, in part true, uh, also is foolhardy to believe that our problems are simply because I IP is being stolen. That's going to happen. Think smart so it's not stolen. You can protect what you have, scale out into the world. The paradox is that that's how you're going to truly protect what you have because that scaling will allow others to take advantage. If you don't allow them to take advantage, they're either going to steal it anyway yeah. or they're going to come up with another way to do it. So one way or another, your business will be challenged. Why not get out ahead of it? and scale around the world and reap the benefit by helping others lift themselves up and deter like the copying and deter the alternatives so that you can reap the financial uh, benefits for your company, for your investors and your community and for your country. And that's the message that I would give uh, to the president, bring it home, yeah. share it with the world and be smart about how to protect it and stop putting the fear of God in the hearts and minds of our people that if we venture out in the world, somebody's going to steal it. That's a foolhardy notion. And unfortunately, that's what people think. And I wanted to bring the lie to that because I've been around the world. I've worked with many breakthrough companies. We didn't really talk about my background. We could do that next, maybe as a final point. Yeah. Uh, and people will appreciate from what I've done that what I've said is actually the reality and that what they read in the press is really causing fear and fear is what holds us back and we're more held back. We're not yeah. doing what we're here to do in this world for our children, for our community, for our country. And I'm here to change that. That's awesome. I, I love the message. And it, last question, if I could ask you, Robert, and I know I'm kind of putting you on the hot seat here. We're not going to hold you to it though, but you alluded to some of these innovations. You mentioned the, you know, spraying the sides of buildings, you know, with this, uh, 
a solar polymer or whatever it may be. Are there other things out there, if you are allowed, that that you could tell us are some of these innovations that people can watch out for and say, wow, I, you know, I remember hearing about that. And now look, here it is. Yeah, I can totally do that. I'll give you another <laughs> example. So we talked about the textile industry and, yep. and how recycling waste for pennies on the dollar, but selling it at the same price as Virgin, but without all the costs, creates a very high profit margin business, like a drug business, new mm -hmm. drug, your pharmaceutical drug. We talked about coating the windows and walls of buildings to power your building with renewable energy with a coating you can't see with your eyes rather than a panel that doesn't look all that attractive on your roof. Uh, a third example, and uh, uh, before I give you the third example, I think there's an underlying theme. Wow, this isn't a software company. This isn't Uber. This isn't Twitter, right? This isn't Facebook. It's not something I would have thought of. And so I'm trying to uh, uh, take away the veil from the industrial side of the house where really the next unicorns are being built today mm -hmm. that we need to covet and grow here in the United States. And we need my kind of capital model, a revenue sharing IP capital or breakthrough IP focused model that helps these companies grow uh, and we need to do it uh, so we don't lose our advantage uh, to the rest of the world that now has these A teams. So yeah. uh, the third example, which doesn't sound all that sexy, but man, does it, does it, does it throw a punch. So the developed world over the past 30 years has been undergoing a quiet revolution. I like to call it a quiet revolution because it is. And it's something you've never thought of, but do you know that all most of your windows today in all the buildings, homes and high rises actually already have a coating on them that reduces the heating and cooling requirements of your building by 50%? I have heard that, yeah. It's called low E, you can't see with your eyes. Well, um, this company, uh, uh, one of my other companies uh, has come up with a fundamental innovation that changes the way you put that coating on right now the glass is made and the coating is put on the outside of the glass so it has to sit in two panes of glass and a double pane window which drives up the cost uh in the developed world it's affordable they have the economics to pay for it the standard in the developing world is single pane glass they can't afford that second piece of glass so they can't take advantage of low e because that coating that we call it a soft coating put on after the fact has to be protected from the environment. So it has to live inside two pieces of glass sealed mm -hmm. in a double pane window. Well, if I want to help the rest of the world that's rising rapidly, rapid urbanization, economic transformation. So the big companies can sell them all the modern conveniences of life and grow their business. There's a big transformation going on on the Southern hemisphere. We're up in the Northern hemisphere. We, you know, we need a way to bring efficiency and to allow them to take advantage of that 50% savings. So here's a company that can take that soft coat and when that glass is being made, make a hard coat, meaning put that coating inside the glass before it's cooled. It can live in a single pane, not a double pane, and it can give the rest of the world the same benefits that we get in the developed world because they can drive the cost to make that down dramatically over what it costs sure. to make that low E window today. So I'm involved in taking that technology and scaling it around the world so that the rest of the world is lifted uh, in a, what I like to call a humanitarian effort. So not only am I focused in green, I'm focused on leveling the playing field um, because rising all boats has another paradox. If everybody's rising up, more and more of those 8 billion people can buy American goods and products. It's the reason we push democracy around the world to open markets. Yeah. Another way we open markets is by making or making them more prosperous. So American innovation and the empire was built on American empire was built on sharing innovations around the world. That next generation is here, ready to go. We need to fund it. We need to replicate how we created the empire in the first place, rise all boats, be the light that shines on the world that we were founded to become and ensure the light that has grown dim shines bright again. That is so cool. And that's where sometimes one plus one equals 11. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah, exactly. That is great. 
Well, Robert, thank you so much for your time and, uh, you know, sharing everything here that there is opportunity to both be profitable and make money and go green and be righteous all at the same time. And, uh, you know, that's, that's so exciting that that exists out there. And, um, you know, I, I'm sure people are going to want to know more. Uh, where can folks find you if they want to know more about what you're doing, what you're investing in and uh, your whole model? So they can go to my website, Cody Capital, C-O-T-E, capital.com. They'll learn about my model, my process on the site. I have videos there to kind of dig deep into why, uh, how it's different than venture capital. And essentially, I go through uh, much of what we talked about today in more detail. My process and how I think about making an investment, we touched on some of those elements. Today, mm -hmm. they'll see that uh, on the website as well. So I try to be as transparent as possible to educate the market on why me, why the, or, or why us, uh, uh, it's not just me, there's a big team behind me, uh, and, and why us now, why it's so important. And so they can go review that. We're also uh, pushing out a fund, uh, uh, an IP capital fund, we call it. It's venture capital, but it's using my model, focusing on transitioning the world green and the hardware space, also having a humanitarian impact as well. And if they uh, would like to be an investor, we'll be opening that fund for investment. You'll be able to co-invest. Uh, we'll have an allocation for, I like to say the people are accredited investors. It'll be a deal we're already doing, but I believe that the people who can benefit most from these innovations ought to participate in it, even though they may not have the capital. And so I'd like to have some percentage, let's call it 20% of everything I do, be open up to the public. Uh, so they can participate in bringing the change that we all want to see instead of sitting back thinking it's hopeless to bring that yeah. change. That's great. Well, Robert, thank you so much again for uh, making some time and coming on the show here today. It was a real pleasure. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yep. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Kaderna podcast. I'm your host, Brian Kaderna, and I can't wait to see you next time. Take care.